Hello and welcome to Elephant Journal's Walk the Talk Show. Today I'm uh, honored and excited to be here with uh, Nick Levinsky. Nick, how are you doing? Good, how are you doing? Good. So you work with Quantum Nutrition Labs. Uh, what is Quantum? Uh, Quantum Nutrition Labs is uh, where the ordinary, why well, have ordinary when you can have extraordinary? We're a supplement manufacturer uh, that produces whole food based supplements. Um, and we've been in business for about 30 years. And, and that's, uh, that's a good long time. Yeah, it's a little bit. We've been, uh, we've been around the block a couple times. Um, yeah. but, uh, we're, we're a serious company about our mission and values. Nice. So, yeah, we're going to get into what those mission and values look like. The supplement industry is, I think, it's billions of dollars uh, industry, right? It's huge. Yeah. It's about to be they estimate over $50 billion this year, actually. Yeah. And if, you re if you've read any of the articles in the New York Times or elsewhere, the supplement industry is riddled with inconsistency and kind of bad product and misleading claims. So our goal at Elephant and with all of our readers is to find companies that we can trust and respect and support. So why should we trust, respect, and support Quantum Nutrition Labs? Well, I think um, you know what we do differently in the industry um, first, like I said earlier, mission and values is very important to us uh, to provide premier quality cellular resident nutraceutical formulas and lifestyle strategies to our customers is our mission. Um, we live that every day. And Can then, you walk me through that mission uh, more slowly? I, that was some big words I, I didn't quite get. Uh, to provide premier quality, so pretty much the best. Actually, one of our values is quality without compromise. Um, so, and that's not just words. You're taking like 70% of the product you get and rejecting it, right? Correct. Set actually more like 75%. Uh, percent. Wow. And just because the world is riddled with adulteration, it's it's not uncommon. And stuff that is used a lot, that's um, basically everybody's using turmeric, honey. Honey is the most adulterated food on the market. Why? Because more people, uh, people consume more honey than the world can produce. So what they do, they put a little bit of syrup, um, uh, tapioca syrup or beet syrup in there, and then right. they have enough material. Same thing with turmeric, you see, oregano, same things. And they do that famously to olive oil. They dilute it with other stuff. Right. So by adulteration, you're not talking about um, having sex out of wedlock. You're talking about messing with the actual product and putting in kind of crappy, cheap substitutes. Um, yes, so basically um, there's different types of adulteration. There's A, there'd be a substitution. They say that it's turmeric when it really could be colored starch. Literally, I've gotten stuff in that was supposed to be carrot when it was actually colored maltodextrin. That's all of us. Colored Not what? Maltodextrin, a starch. It was still yeah. dyed. Um, we've gotten stuff in that we thought was actually pure Siberian ginseng when actually it was 5% something else. They weigh it down. Usually at the end of the harvest season, when there's not enough supply, they just add a little bit in and all of a sudden you have your order. So it's a, it's a cat and mouse game a little bit with the industry. And you gotta be very cautious when you buy a lot of fly-by-night companies out there. Um, there's an ease of entry into this industry. You and I can start a supplement company tomorrow um, and just make it. And, but, it takes years possibly for the FDA to come and actually inspect you. So it's, it's uh, up to the consumer to kind of vet out those supplement uh, manufacturers to make sure they're getting quality product. So we, so we could have Nick and Whalen's uh, supplement company. We just buy this, the crappy stuff. We sell it. We put a nice like trees and nature looking stuff. We say we're the best. We do quality. You know, we can use any words practically we want as long as they're kind of vague. So what stop? So how as a consumer, when I go to the pharmacy or Pharmaca or the grocery store or Walgreens or whatever, how do I know? Are there certifications? How do I know that you're for real and maybe others are not doing that testing? So there's a couple some rules of thumbs that you probably want to follow. Um, something we do and what we suggest, kind of what separates the good companies from the great companies, um, is to have a third party uh, GMP certification. That's actually not required by the law. You don't have to have that. You just have to be GMP compliant per the final rule of FDA. We're USP uh, GMP certified, our manufacturers, and they're one of six companies in the world 
So it's very difficult. Why? Uh, why did they choose that? Because it goes above and beyond what the law requires. Be the best. So, so not that we will, because there's a lot of cool stuff we're going to get into, including some slides showing the adulteration and kind of pollution or, of the product. But we could stop the video right there in the sense that we now know that anything I say that's nice about you or you say that's nice about your own company, that's fine, but you're actually certified and we can trust that because that's a third party, meaning you guys aren't certifying yourselves. Yeah. It's a third party checking out the thing and you're one of six companies or manufacturers in the world that is certified. USP, uh, United States Pharmacopoeia certified, correct. Right, nice, I love that. I love that. Some people uh, in the elephant world will say, oh, organic, who cares, it's all BS. And I'm like, no, the certification really matters. There's yeah. a lot of fusion around it. There's things in the organic certification that may not be ideal, but it matters because it's what we can trust and it's our way to steer the entire environmental and kind of health movement. And in the same way with supplements, that sounds like the gold standard or the platinum standard for certifications. Yes, uh, USP is one of them. There's other companies, NSF and items, but you should look for somebody with some type of certification. If you don't, have one, if the company doesn't have one, it's a little bit of a red flag, you should maybe do a little bit more uh, questions for them, ask them for a C of A. Um, you know, honestly, calling them up and asking for a C of A, ask them about their quality unit. Uh, What's the C of A certificate of authenticity? Authority? Uh, certificate of authenticity, authenticity or certificate of analysis, either one. Yeah. Um, oh. So that's important. And look at that certificate of analysis, you know, does it, what tests are there? Does it say identification visual when it's, when it's just visual? So when you get a piece of broccoli, you know it instantly it's broccoli. But whenever you take broccoli and you turn it into a powder, you can't tell me by looking at it that it's broccoli. You right. see that it says identification visual, that's a red flag. <laughs> so you just want to look at that, make sure they have a CVA. That's just one indicator on there, make sure they're testing. Um, also ask for the, from them, how big is their quality unit? We have 30 individuals in quality, 30. Um, and we have a big line, about 90 products or so. Now, they tell you there's only one person, two person in quality, that's another red flag, because there's no way they can do everything. And, right. and they tell you, and they actually say, what is quality? That's even a bigger red flag. <laughs> so you, you just need to ask these questions and find out really what, they, what are they doing? Um, here's a yeah, I mean, elephant's entire staff is 30 people, so that's pretty impressive. Yeah, and that's just quality. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, you know, I think also a common practice is skip lot testing here, and it's, it's actually allowed by law. So, where you can actually get a raw material in and one time uh, test for everything on the C of A that they provide to you, and then you can skip one year, two years, three years, whatever the frequency that you deem is appropriate and not do all the testing, just do ID and micro. So pesticides, heavy metals, aflatoxins. You're not testing any of that. That's a little bit what we do differently. We don't skip lot tests. And some of the pictures I'll maybe show you, be able to show you later, um, yeah. Yeah, especially for botanicals. What's that term, skip law? Skip lot testing. How do you spell that? S-K-I-P, lot, L-O-T, testing. Skip lot, okay. Yeah, basically it's you get a material in, you know, you do the very minimum, you, you skip all the other testing. And that's what I you do. And you get to do a certain amount of frequency that you deem appropriate. But, you know, I see sometimes from good suppliers have issues. Uh, we've seen, you know, glass material, we've seen starch material. Um, and the previous slide, we didn't see it. So I don't, you know, my, my parents eat this, my kids eat this, I, I wouldn't trust it. So that's a common practice. You know, there's some good suppliers out there, but it's something I wouldn't trust to put in my mouth. Because at the end of the day, would you eat it? That's the question. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then what are the other issues around the supplement industry? Is, is there doubt about the efficacy? Like some of this stuff isn't even helpful or what are, what are some of the other issues? Yeah, so let me go Let me go over the, a little bit of the history of what the supplement industry was. Um, in 1994, President, uh, former President Bill Clinton put into law Duchenne, 
That's the Dietary Supplement and Health and Education Act. And basically that gave uh, the protected consumers the right to buy dietary supplements, gave the FDA the oversight for GMPs, giving the rules that all manufacturers have to follow. And there's some other things about new dietary ingredients, which is really about safety. And the supplement industry, unlike pharma, um, supplements have to just prove safety. Efficacy is up to the consumer and they have to do their own research. Pharma has to do clinical trials. So there's a little bit of difference there, what we need to be able to focus on. You should look at supplement companies that use science behind their products yeah. to prove whatever claim they're making. They say it supports heart health. Make sure that you know it's CoQ10 or something else that has some kind of research behind it. Unfortunately, that's the burden of the consumer to be able to do that. And that's that manufacturers should be able to provide you evidence for that if you ask for it. Um, so 1994, that happened and then Let's go up. It took 13 years for the GMPs to be put in place. Um, so that's a long time. And there's actually a lot of things that happened in between. Um, major, major events that kind of led to that GMP. And one of the things, one of them is called uh, a company called Chompers. Uh, it was supposed to be a laxative, a plantain leaf. And what they got in really was Foxglove. And Foxglove has a natural heart arrhythmia drug in it. Because back then you got a, you got C of A, it's supposed to be plantain leaf, so I just put a label on it, you know, and then I shipped it out. This is you know 19, this is about 1997, and a woman went to the hospital because of that. Because back then they didn't know testing. And then if you fast forward to 2007 and eight, melamine, melamine was uh, it's you go to Bed Bath and Beyond, you can find melamine bowls. It's actually a a plastic kind of a cold hard derivative item. If you eat it, it's very toxic. It actually clogs up your uh, your kidneys and gives you renal failure. And what they found is if you put a little bit of melamine into protein, you can bulk it, meaning that uh, it's supposed to be 50% protein. You dilute it, with, I don't know, something cheap, and then you put a little bit of melamine, all of a sudden it's back to 50%, even though it's really not. So they started doing this in dog food, and meat gluten in dog food in 2007. Oh. Started dying. So FDA oh. put a statement out, you probably find in the archives of FDA, they put a big statement out to not buy these dog foods. This same practice happened in China in the milk supply and went into baby food. 40,000 babies went to the hospital, 40,000. This was 2008. And then you can look up, uh, there's a 60 minutes on a uh, selenium adulteration where this was a liquid uh, multivitamin and it said it's supposed to have like 20 micrograms of selenium. It had 200 times the amount that was going to live. 200 times. Now, selenium you need, you have to have it. It's essential. But if you have 200 times, what happens? Your fingernails start falling out, your hair starts falling out, and the people had conditions, so they took more and people went to the hospital. So it was so bad that the manufacturer, this was actually due to dry lab. There was a manufacturer there. This is kind of right, the cusp of GMPs. And there was so much selenium that it was crashing out of solution. It was just, the powder wouldn't go into solution. So they took pantyhose to pull out the extra and then they bottled it. Not even thinking that it's a problem. So, you know, in the beginning, back in 2008, uh, when I started with this company over 10 years ago, um, there was only 50 of us total. And back then, the FDA just wanted to know you were doing something. Are you testing? Because most of the industry wasn't testing. They say up to 20% of the industry is not testing at all. Of the inspections that happen every year, only 5% of the industry is inspected every year, about five or six. Of them, 58% fail. And what do they fail for? The same thing, number one, every year since 2008, uh, specifications, testing. They don't, either they don't have them, they don't do it properly, or they just don't do it. Right. And that's, that's, a, that's the, like, the core basis of what you buy, it's the quality. And that's, that's the scary part. You gotta be able to trust that supplier to make sure they're doing all that kind of testing, they have specifications for the product, and they're doing what's necessary. So in a way that's, uh really good for you or for any company that actually is testing and certified and yeah 
has some loyalty and trust built in because basically like all the cars over here are blowing up when you drive them off the lot. And then there's a couple car manufacturers who are trustworthy and they work. So yeah, not to put doom and gloom on everything. There's some good players out here and yeah. probably, you know, maybe it's, they say of the, su of the supplements that are sampled for studies, 70 to 90% are adulterated or work have some kind of misbranding on them. And that's, there's studies on this and just pulling it off the shelf. And because either they're just not doing the right test. And I can tell you, so 2008 doesn't stop. So we go, let's go to 2015. 2015 was a big year. Remember the New York Attorney General went after Target, uh, GNC, um, I believe it was Walmart as well, saying they had misbranded items. And the big thing about that was that, you know, not only is the manufacturer responsible, but the retailers are responsible too. Because um, GNC had to settle with the DOJ for like $2 million. Wow. So a big deal. And then that same year, USP Labs, uh, was a manufacturer saying they're putting natural plant extracts in the product. There were synthetics from China. Now, a hundred other companies got indicted that same year for doing the same exact thing. But it wasn't, you know, it wasn't just the president that went to jail or the, the company closed down. Their quality unit got indicted, their production, because it takes a team. It's a team to do this. I couldn't by myself go back there and make all this stuff and sell it. It's a, it's a whole operation. So, you know, it doesn't really stop there. It continues. We see Viagra put into products. Um, Subutramine, which is a drug for weight loss. Viagra put into products? Yeah, so sexual health is a uh, category of concern, I would say. Uh, sexual health, weight loss, CBD are all categories where there's a lot of money to be made. So a lot of where there's money to be made, adulteration happens. Right. So for, for literally for sexual health, people will crush up PDE5 inhibitors, which is Viagra, Cialis, and they'll put it into products. But these are not necessarily Viagra. These are the analogs that the pharmaceutical companies threw away that they didn't use, that are being made in China, cheap, brought over here and putting in there to give it a clinical effect. So, and they find this all the time. This is happening constantly from, you know, uh, sexual health, weight loss, subutramine, I said it, which is a drug, Saw this about six, year, six years ago, saw it again last year in, in a dietary supplement. And what they do is say, for example, Cialis has 150 different analogs. They put one in commerce until it gets caught and they wait, put another one in commerce until it gets caught and wait. Because it's very hard to detect it and it takes literally phytoforensics to figure this out. CBD. So, so are they not getting fined enough or something? Well, for it to be worth it for them to just lie? It was the, the ease of entry. Me and you can start a supplement company. And one of the requirements on the supplements is that you have to put your name and address on there. These guys are not doing that. And so they have to literally go find these companies where they're at to stop it because it's just flooding the market. It's fly by night. Make as much money as I can until I get caught. And that's what's happening. And sometimes, you know, there's, there's manufacturers that just don't do the right testing to understand in their product and they're like, wow, we're getting all these effects. Um, so it must be good. Let's continue to sell this. But really, it's a drug that they put into the product. So that's why uh, the AD uh, or the AG had to decided to hold the distributors or the target and the whatever uh, liable because you can't catch all these sketchy manufacturers. You have to yeah, you have to yeah, you have to require the the stores to say who are you, where are you coming from, are you for real? Yeah, correct. And basically, they put their foot down that year. But um, and the FDA has progressively done a little bit more and more. Um, ABH was a company just in January um, was for ten years they had citations, and this is you know public knowledge. They had um, and it took ten years for the FDA to put a cease and desist. An injunction on them to stop selling and mandated a recall of six years worth of product. 859 brands were affected. 859 from this one contract manufacturer for GMP violation that spanned back 10 years. So it takes time for FDA to get in there. So it's so important for the consumer to do their homework. They have to do their homework because these are big manufacturers. They're doing 859 brands out there. Now, 
there's a lot of brands. They say there's over 80,000 supplements on the market. Yeah. And keep trying. Well, I'm sure you go to Natural Products Expo West and, you know, the supplement area is just like a huge expo and it's endless, you know, not this year because of COVID. But um, yeah. So um, are there any uh, shops like, say, do you know Pharmaca? I'm sure you do, where you they you trust their selection process. So like everyone is good or do you always as the consumer have to look for the certifications and and such. I think it's a um, general rule of thumb. You should always look for certifications. Um, I think that it's once again, it's not required. You don't have to have it. But right at face value, if I'm looking at it, you know, at the store on the shelf, doesn't have it on there. It doesn't have the address and, you know, right. what company it is. Um, you know, all those kind of just face value. Personally, if I was going to buy something other than us, which I don't know if I would now knowing but I know, um, you know, I would call, literally call the company and ask them questions because that's the only way you're going to get a great answer on this because there's a lot of marketing that goes into this and, you know, it's, and it gets you to buy it. So asking the questions, the hard questions, you skip lot tests, how big is your quality unit? Do you use magnesium steroid? You know, magnesium steroid is an excipient. A lot of people use because it makes it easier to produce. It's a flow agent. Um, but magnesium steroid has been shown to metabolize to formaldehyde in small amounts. You don't want that. You don't want to stop doing that. And what we've been, you know, Marshall, what they call is clean label. That's something that's new. Five or six years, big, big in the industry. Dr. Marshall started that back in the 90s. You know, that was a big thing for him. Uh, well, to put those Dr. Marshall in. is is your founder? Yes, Dr. Marshall is founder. He, uh, he passed away about three years ago. Uh, he's survived by his wife, uh, Dr. Forbes, who's now the CEO, but she carries on the vision that he started. So I, I love that you said, you know, if I were to buy some product other than ourselves, knowing what I know, I wouldn't. Like, saying everything you're saying, like the formaldehyde and the Viagra and, you know, the, the starch and the glass, you know, it kind of makes me not want to buy anything, but then I have to remind myself, well, there actually is a reason people are trying to make all this money in such sketchy ways. It's because this stuff does serve a need and a purpose if it's done right. So again, the certification gets to know quantum and maybe other companies you trust. So um, one question, you guys say you care about nature and all that. I hear that from every company ever. I looked on your site and it says, even in some details, which I love, like you ship using paper tape, not plastic tape. You, you know, you're doing some little details that only companies like Elephant and I could name only maybe like six other companies actually do these things because we care. What are some of the environmentally responsible practices you follow? Well, so corporate social responsibility is a big deal for us and it has always been. Um, one of the, you know, our carbon footprint we're very conscious of. Um, we have 600 solar panels on our both. We have two buildings, 600. Yeah. Um, so it's, it, it literally stretches across. Um, we use for for our actual staff. We use low VOC paint, um, magnesium oxide board, so there's no outgassing. Um, we use, as like you said, the actual paper tape rather than the plastic tape. We've reduced our usage of just materials by 30%. Um, so there's less waste. Um, we're also uh, very conscious of, um, you know, recycling. We try to do that across the facility, um, you know, wherever we can, um, using stuff that's reusable, we can as well. Uh, but I think that's we, right. reusable, reusable item. So, and that's, you know, that's, I think we try to take a stance there. And we're also giving back to the community. We do something called Hire Our Heroes, where we partner with the uh, military and people that are coming from active duty to civil uh, civilian life, we give them a chance to do an internship to kind of get back assimilated to the community, possibly hire them on, or otherwise they have that experience put on the resume while they try to find a job. And then also coming back to the shipping, uh, I think you got rid of all the like styrofoam peanuts and Correct. you do paper filler, like um, yeah, unbleached paper filler of some sort. Yes. Um, yeah, love all that. Uh, that that kind of detail, um, everything you just listed, 
communicates that you actually care, that it's not just sort of greenwashing, it's not just a commercial, it's not just marketing. Yeah. Um, and then let's get into some of the fun things. Like, you know, here in Boulder, um, you know, my friends roll up in their plastic yoga pants with their PVC yoga mat, hop out of their Lexus SUV, and they jump into a fancy organic juice joint and pay $12 for like a turmeric juice. But turmeric has all kinds of issues. Yeah. Um, let's let's go through some of those slides and some of the issues that are kind of fun. Let me pull that up real quick for you. Uh, show screen. Can you see this, Whaley? Yes. So this is an example of a Siberian ginseng that we got in years ago. Um, on the left, the adulterated one, you can plainly see compared to the right picture that, that it's different. And the right picture is standard, what it should look like, compared to what we hear on the left is what we got in. And this is economic adulteration, meaning we got 25 barrels of this. Uh, this material had about 5% evenly distributed throughout. So what they did is they blended it in and then they uh, sold it to give it more weight. And I got to ask you, Waylon, would you feed this to your kids? Would you feed this to your parents or even your dog? Um, you know, at the end of the day, I, I wouldn't give this to anybody. So um, ginseng is supposed to look like the one on the right. It's not messed with. Adulterated means messed with, basically. Correct. And on the left, what is all that stuff they're putting in there? Like starch or what? This one was some kind of calcium, they said oxalates, some kind of calcium material. We didn't go down the path to identify exactly what it was because it's, you know, adulterate. The FDA has recognized this is a major problem and they brought up the idea of, you know, what do you think happens um, when, you know, this is found? We, we ship it back to the men, to the supplier, right? What do you think they do? They're not, they're not just keeping it and, and throwing it away. They're shipping it to somebody else, maybe with less quality standards than you have. And the FDA has suggested that this should be burned, but nobody wants to burn money. Um, so that's that's the big problem in the industry. That's, you know, with these issues, this stuff that I wouldn't feed to my dog um, is out there. Somebody's eating this somewhere. So what do you do with that stuff when you get it? It's, we return it. Um, you know, I can't say that we burn it or that, but we, we notify the supplier um, and we return it. Uh, because yes, we are we are business, but it, it is a problem in the industry and what we have to do with this. And we don't usually if we find this kind of adulteration, we'll never work with them again. But why exactly that? So why wouldn't you sue them, or why wouldn't you? I mean, it sounds like you almost need thirty people in your legal department, you know, to handle this stuff. Yeah, um, usually it never gets out to the point where we're supplying this to our customers or it's in the public. This is at the qualification stage of the raw material. And this material then is by whenever it's qualified, goes through this rigorous testing and we identify it. And if it fails, we just return it back, um, which is a problem we understand in the industry and the industry needs to come up with a way. They thought about doing a blog maybe, the FDA, saying that there's, you know, this, this supplier is an issue. Um, so they've been talking about this for years, haven't done anything, just, you know, really put something in place. Um, but that's kind of at the speed of the government right now. And there's no way, probably a dumb question, but there's no way to like put this through some kind of filter and clean it. No, and would you want to? Because, you know, there's gonna be a percentage of whatever this stuff is that's still in there. There's no way to get 100% of it out. And, you know, yeah. just, you don't know what it is. You don't, it's not supposed to be there. Um, and at the end of the day, you're eating this. So would you really, would you eat this? Yeah, it does seem like there needs to be a log because yeah. I just don't understand how you as a company could ever trust that supplier again if they had no. said something. Like I said most of them when we find these, here's another example of another item. Um, here's an alfalfa. We got this uh, TLC, beautiful. This looks great. This is what you see on reports. But when we put we put it under my car, something we do differently here at Quantum Nutrition Labs, we require our testing to be done by orthogonal testing. That's doing multiple testing uh, techniques for one for one answer, and that's identity. And we do microscopy, TLC, ash and acid, acid and soluble ash. 
Here we did the microscopy with the TLC. TLC was fine, it is alfalfa, but then we found glass, literally in the product. Um, this one was from a well-known supplier and something happened in the manufacturing process, grinding that somehow that got in there. Um, we worked with a supplier on this, it wasn't intentional, but somebody, you know, if we didn't catch it, somebody would be eating this right now. They said they destroyed the lot, you know, once again, a reputable supplier, uh, but without doing this extra test, somebody would be eating this right now. Same thing with this next one, here's a turmeric. Uh, turmeric's been notorious for adulteration. I have to say that we've seen uh, lead paint in turmeric, literally lead chromate to make it look uh, brighter hue. And Stanford University identified that in you know the November, seeing this out of Bangladesh, but we saw this in coming out of India back in 2012. And you know, it continues. Here it's a beautiful TLC. The next page is actually under the microscope. And it's, you know, turmeric is a root. It's made of starch. But depending on how the starch aggregates, uh, I can tell you if it's been adulterated. And here you see little squares on the right picture. That kind of indicated that they put an added starch in there to weigh it down. That basically colored starch. Uh, exactly right there. So, this, these are kind of um, pictures showing, you know, without doing this additional testing, you just do the one test that looks, you know, really nice. Uh, and a lot of people put it on the reports because it makes them look kind of CSI-like. Um, it really doesn't matter at the end of the day because there still could be other adulteration they're just not looking for. Right, right. Wild. Lead paint. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. Um, so... Again, uh, what is the certification that we should all look for? Is there one that's enough to look for, or do we have to know, like, kind of get to know, like, three or four or five or six? Um, I think the major ones is, you know, USP, NSF are the big players for CGMP certification. Look for either one, inquire about it from the company. Are they USP? Are they NSF certified? But they'll put it on their bottle. They'll put it on their bottle, right? Not necessarily. Uh, you have to call in. There's there's different programs. One, like the program that we're in, our, our facility is USP. There's another one where they do some other testing on the bottle itself. Um, you have to call in to ask. Um, sometimes they advertise it maybe on some literature on their website. Um, also, asking for a C of A, I think, is very important. See, are they testing? Uh, do they have identification visual? That's very important to ask. Um, and non-GMO, organic, of course, are big ones. Anybody can put on non-GMO. And, you know, I think the non-GMO verified is a great program that helps you easily identify. There's it's a robust process to get through that. Right. Wow. The whole field seems so sketchy. So um, do you, are there certifications on your bottles that we can look for? Uh, for us, we're uh, USP, GMP, we're going after USP Verified, which would have a few products that we are kosher certified as well. Uh, but most of our tests are beyond, we go above and beyond what the CFR requires. So you, you got the certification, we do more than that. Um, so like I said, methodical testing, TLC, like I showed you, uh, the microscopy, ash and acid and soluble ash, which is looking at organics, we do Heavy metals, everybody does heavy metals. If you lead, arsenic, cadmium, mercury, we're also looking for antimony, tin, tungsten, and nickel. So we do more because those are heavy metals concerned. There's been recalls on some of those. Yeah. Um, we also do aphitoxins. Aphitoxins uh, is made by mold. Mold is everywhere. You know, there's mold in the air, everywhere. And it, make, it makes a metabolite, a mycotoxin, that uh, you find it on grains, you find it on different items, cayenne pepper, major contamination with aflatoxin. You gotta be very careful with that. Um, but aflatoxin is one of the most carcinogenic items known to man. And people are just not testing for it. In extract, when you extract it, so you use ethanol, methanol, whatever, it concentrates it. So all of a sudden you can have high amounts. I've literally had $100,000 worth of uh, extract come in and completely high levels of aflatoxin. They don't test for it on the raw material end. So we're like, well, we can't accept this. They wouldn't work with us again. They're, they're like, you're the only ones complaining. 
Why are we the only ones complaining? Well, because, you know, like I said, we're not buying everything. They're selling to multiple companies. So, well, they're not doing the testing. That's why. Uh, because at the end of the day, it costs a lot of money to do this. So, yeah, I guess that's what I'm trying to get at without making, like, you uncomfortable, putting you in a weird position is, are you guys like the only company that we can trust or are there other ones that you kind of, that you say, yeah, they're doing all this testing, they're good? Um, unfortunately, the, you know, there's, there's other companies being transparent out there. I think there's some great companies out there and I'm not gonna necessarily list any companies out there that are like that, but you wanna try, maybe trust the bigger brands, the ones that are willing to disclose, call them up, ask them, you know, give me the CFA, ask them the questions I said, you know, yeah. do you have certain third party CG and D? What's your quality using? Do you have magnesium carrier in there? Um, what else are you doing to help protect us? You're doing aflatoxin testing, heavy metals. You know, all these questions you need to ask them. And I can't say we're the only ones. I'm, I'm, they say 20% of the industry is not uh, testing at all. So you have to realize that. 55% is tested, uh, inspected every year. 58% fail of those inspection specifications. But, you know, I think there's some good players, probably the bigger, larger companies uh, that are doing the right things. And there's probably some other companies as well. But um, you just, the biggest thing I guess I could tell everybody is that you have to do your homework. You have yeah. to ask the questions. You can't go by blind faith. Yeah. Have there been significant, like, um, class action lawsuits uh, brought to any of these companies? Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, you know, I think uh, over the time for different items, if especially, you know, it's, it's the DOJ literally going after you <laughs> for some of these uh, adulterations. USB Labs, they talked about raw deal was literally putting fillers in his product. The president had 40 months uh, for, he was hiding it from the FDA when they came in. And then once they left, he would add in, you know, you know calcium carbonate, whatever, and told people it was 100% whatever the material was, lying to the public. Right. Yeah, this is not to get too political, but, you know, what we're seeing with the EPA and a lot of push people pushing for the EPA to reduce, uh, you know, their oversight of various industries and say, hey, let businesses do whatever they want. Um, this is why we have some of the red tape and we want to make sure stuff is not going to hurt, you know, the little man, the little lady, the ordinary um, citizens who are purchasing this yeah. stuff with, with good intentions. They're saying, I need to be healthier for this thing, you know, I'm taking B12 or whatever I'm taking. I don't want that laced with lead paint or whatever it is. Yeah, and right now it's just, they're understaffed. You have a $50 billion industry and the FDA for dietary supplements, it's approximately about 50 people for $50 billion industry. So that's why they only do 5% a year. Oh, right. And it keeps growing, 6% this year, 12%. Um, it's um, constantly growing. Let's take uh, one minute. What are a couple of the products you offer that you love, like for various health uh, needs? Oh man, it's like picking your favorite child. Um, I think what, what really makes us unique, uh, we offer fermentation products. We actually ferment B vitamins. Um, B12, for example. Uh, we have a fermented B12, uh, quantum B12, I believe. I don't have it here. But um, it's actually, we take B12, methylcobalamin, and venoslipobalamin, which are the blood active forms, um, and throughout your body, and we ferment that. And it makes what's called hydroxycobalamin, which is another form that circulates in your blood. Actually, hydroxycobalamin is the longest lasting in your blood, and it can interchange between the two. There is no other product on the market. We ferment it with a probiotic, a proprietary blend, and we add a, it's a molasses-based fermentation. Um, and we had 100% cane, uh, organic cane ethanol to stop the fermentation. It helps with bioavailability. Hands down, the best B12 you'll ever find, and you will not find any other B12 on the market like ours, period. So repeat for me, that sounded amazing, but repeat for me, what, why do you ferment it? Um, the fermentation process for that is a, first of all, fermentation produces postbiotics. So you're gonna get lactic acid, enzymes, other items that are beneficial for gut health and just overall health. Mm -hmm. Second, it produces another form of B12 that's active in the body as well. So you have all three active forms, which go go to look online, go to any store, you're not gonna find it. You're not gonna find methyl, adenosyl, 
and hydroxyl. What you find is cyanocholine, which is the cheap form. And what the, what the body has to do, remember I told you about magnesium stearate and formaldehyde. Here, the body has to take that cyan, cyanide and pull that off and make it into the active form. But it's a cheap, it's a very cheap form. So, you know, ours is a premium product, it's fermented, but you're gonna get all what's good for your body and nothing else. And then when you're adding ethanol, that sounds not good, but that's okay? It's a, it's, it's, a, it's organic, uh, non-GMO, uh, cane alcohol, um, and it's 25% to stop the fermentation because we don't want it to continue to ferment. Um, also, it increases bioavailability, helps you absorb it. Um, you, have to, you have to add some oil or some alcohol or something? Yeah, the alcohol itself, just to help with the bioavailability and to stop the fermentation process. Awesome. Well, Nick, anything else you wanted to touch on? Um, you know, I think it's a really uh, great story how the company started. If you wanted to yeah, hear Yeah, please. That. I'd love to hear that. Quantum Nutrition Labs um, was started back in 1987. Dr. Marshall, he was a clinical nutritionist, and um, he was seeing patients, and he was recommending he didn't have his own company at the time. He was more distributing products. He was an athlete. He was a long-distance runner, a uh, very avid runner. Uh, he always told me that he could always beat the fastest woman <laughs> out there. He could be the fastest man, but he could be the fastest woman. Uh, but he was he wanted to run and kept and he wanted to do more sports performance. So he would take his own products too, not his own products, but supplements himself. And he had a specific formula he had a friend make for him for his own proprietary band of uh, amino acids to help for sports performance. Uh, unfortunately, uh, and he told his friend. I want one manufacturer to make this product, the raw, the, the amino acid. Fortunately, his friend, you know, he was selling it to him, found a cheaper source and substituted it in. He didn't tell him about it. And literally did this for a year. Dr. Marshall Tate, he started noticing these symptoms, uh, you know, muscle pain, uh, joint pain. Uh, he was having lung issues. Um, he was just trying to get to the point where he couldn't even walk more than five minutes without having to take a break. And what he no, it was something called EMS. It was uh, esnophilia myalgia syndrome, which is from L-tryptophan that's been tainted with it by a GMO organism. This is back in 1987. He was not only infected. 37 people died from this. 1,500 people were disabled. And some of those 1,500 also died later on in life. Um, and he kept taking it, and he didn't know it was there until the FDA literally came to his door and told him to stop taking it. They found out that he had some supply of this L-tryptophan and did that. But the damage was done. He was, you know, poisoned for literally over a year. Um, and it got so bad that, you know, one day he was sitting on the edge of his bed, the internal monologue telling him, you know, I can help everybody else but myself. You know, imagine being able, you're helping all these people. You just can't help yourself. That's, that's horrible. So he finally, you know, he's like, he kind of accepted his fate, if you will, at that point. Um, and said, I'm gonna go somewhere warm. He was in Torrance, California. Wanted to go to Mexico and pretty much live out his last days there. Uh, he had a, a grown up daughter and a, a son that he's gonna go put letters in there, don't come find me. And packed up his bags one Sunday and decided I'm gonna go to church one more time uh, before I leave, the local church that he always went to. Went to service um, and then at the end of service, this really gets really fun. At the end of service, he hears this looming voice behind him. He said, Dr. Marshall. It's like, Dr. Marshall was from New York. So as a young person in New York, he got in a lot of fights. So when somebody yells at your name like that, you kind of just like, am I about to get in a fight? So he's like, Dr. Marshall. He looks back and sees some guy coming up to him. He says, he's like, who are you? And he says, I'm Big John. He's like, okay, I've never met Big John before. So he's like, okay, how you doing? I got a message for you. And Big John's, and Dr. Marshall's like, okay, tell me what's the message. And uh, Big John's like, I know you're feeling bad right now, but it's going to get better. And you're going to have the power to heal others soon. And, you know, when somebody tells you this and you're like, and Dr. Marshall tells you the story, you know, you're like, okay, this is weird. I don't know who you are. And so afterwards, he went and actually asked the pastor, he's like, you know, Big John. And the pastor's like, yeah, he comes in every couple, you know, it's a couple times a year and tells people things. He doesn't hurt anybody. We don't really say anything. 
in the congregation doesn't have not complained about it, but he says some of the stuff comes true. And, you know, needless to say, what that did was redirect him. He was like, you know, is that a sign or what it is? But put him on a different course. And first thing he did, he went back to his son and daughter's house, took out the letters they left him, and decided to, you know, try to use natural health, uh, natural products to heal him. He struggled for years, finally met Dr. Forbes, who became his wife, and she actually healed him. Uh, to a point, he always struggled with this throughout, you know, until his death. Uh, but he healed him uh, with natural products. He actually sued the company that had the Ultra Monks, many people that sued them, uh, took that settlement money and started quantum nutrition labs and said, I will not let myself or anybody else go through that ever. Wow. So that, you know, it's, it's one of those stories you hear and you're like, wow. You know, you really um, whoever Big John was, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and he's you know one of the, one of the great things he tells me is like at the end of the day, and I said this earlier, whenever you're thinking about quality, would you eat it? Because right. that's the ultimate thing, because you're putting it in your body, and if you can't say you would eat it, don't sell. So, anyway, uh, yeah, that's how it's. Right. It's very, very. Uh, it's a great story. Yeah, it is a great story because especially like even the very end where you, he took that settlement money and started the company. Like literally your company's DNA is founded in rejecting the kind of evil, cynical practices that are unfortunately so common in this multi-billion dollar industry and offering customers what they are looking for and expecting. Yeah. So. I love that. You need a big John line of uh, products. <laughs> that might be something that comes out. You never know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, a little, a little, that would be great. Um, well, thank you so much, Nick. Uh, this is, I, you know, I feel like uh, running out to Pharmaco, which is a couple blocks from here. And because I have this whole lineup of, you know, whatever I've been told to take. Yeah. And I, I usually ask, I go to Pharmaco, it's a place I like. And I trust people, and I say, "What what should I get? What's quality?" But I'm not that careful about it, you know. Yeah, and the great thing, you know, hopefully I gave a little bit of advice for everybody out there to maybe go. Um, always feel free to call in. We actually have a full staff. We're not just online. We have a full staff of experts, literally dietitians, nutritionists on staff here that you can call in and speak for free. You, know, you don't have to pay for it. Um, that guide you through the products. So feel free to call. Uh, or go to qnlabs.com. qnlabs.com. Well, Nick, thank you so much. And uh, everyone check out Quantum Nutrition Labs. And if you've learned something helpful in here, please share it. Let's get the word out and make it uncomfortable for the bad actors in this, uh, yep. in this industry. Thank yeah. You. Thank you. QN Labs. Have a good day. I think we're good. It says live still. Yeah. yeah. So next meeting room, we'll just cut it there. Uh, you got the link there. Mm -hmm. Copy and paste that, and you got the password. Okay. Let me. Oh, probably could just debrief here. Yeah. Let me see.